I am going to make a start. I believe that we are now live. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I always say that because I'm so aware of different time zones. My name is Stacey Alvarez de la Campa, and I am the content and community manager here at Island Innovation. And uh, this live stream today is going to focus once again on the blue economy. It's part of our activities leading up to the UN Oceans Conference, the United Nations Ocean Conference, which is taking place in Lisbon, coming up in Portugal from June 27th to July 1st. So today we're going to be hearing from a wonderful guest, Dr. Shelley Ann Cox. She's a fisheries management specialist. She also has her own consultancy firm entitled Blue Shell Productions. We can see that Dr. Cox is perfectly placed for this discussion. She's in Barbados. I wish I was there with her on the beach, <laughs> but she's joining us from the beach. So Welcome. Thank you so much for agreeing to, to take part in our live stream, Dr. Cox. We really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Stacey. It's a pleasure. And greetings from the beautiful Brandon Beach on the west coast of Barbados. Yes, awesome. Okay, so um, we have as your official title that you are an ocean professional, which I just think sounds fantastic, and a fisheries management specialist. So can you tell us a little bit about your role and you know, kind of the role you play in the blue economy? Yes, um, well, I wear several hats, um, but I like to refer to myself as an oceanpreneur now. Um, having uh, stepped out in faith from academia um, to start my own consultancy firm. And of course, a lot of the work I do is around the ocean, um, be it uh, fisheries management related or sargasm management and governance. Um, so on the sargasm side of things, I work as a coordinator and co-editor of the Sargasm Outlook Bulletin. It presents three months and six months experimental forecasts, um, but we've packaged it in a way and co-developed this product with stakeholders in a process since 2019. And I think what we really wanted to emphasize on was the fact that we were communicating implications of the forecast to sectors and other sargasm forecast bulletins um, weren't doing that. Um, so that was really our emphasis and really to point people to, you know, we have the spotlight on sargasm innovation. We have the latest research. Um, you know, we also um, cover, you know, interesting features of youth innovating as it relates to sargasm. And you may have heard, you know, 2022 is breaking the records as it relates to the biomass in, in the Atlantic. Um, so in that respect, I've been working to address sargasm as a hazard, um, but as, as an opportunity as well. Um, teaming up with my colleagues, we wrote a uses guide for sargasm. And now we are still interfacing with some of those innovators as they create some amazing products some with bioplastic, um, some piloting microbinary refineries for high value extracts. Others, um, Dr. Legina Henry at UE taking rum, wastewater, and sargasm and black belly sheep manure um, to produce bio um, compressed natural gas. So lots of um, activities going on in that space as it relates to sargasm. Um, but as a fisheries management specialist, you know, I was always interested in, you know, the issues and the impacts on the fishery sector. Um, so my background there really started around co-management, uh, where the empowerment of the resource users themselves, uh, fisher folk, uh, was an integral part of the decision-making processes process. Um, so from, you know, the active involvement of fisheries advisory committees, for example, that saw uh, membership from different um, sectors, stakeholders along the value chain um, to other mechanisms, for example, the Caribbean Network of Fisher Food Organizations at the regional level. Um, so I've been doing a lot of work uh, from about 2009 and being fully immersed in fishing communities um, here in St. Lucia. Um, so, you know, lots of my time has been spent fishing, spear fishing, free diving, um, going out on boats, attending parties, uh, even funerals, unfortunately, sometimes. Uh, but I've taken that transdisciplinary approach to research. And I think it's also, I guess, richer uh, than just, you know, shorts. There, there's lots of limitations with tourism. 
Yes. Well, that's fantastic. It sounds like you bring together so many vital things to this concept of the blue economy. Um, you mentioned sargassum. For those watching may not know, that's this type of seaweed or seagrass, some people might call it, that we have in the region that it kind of blooms across the ocean and it, you know, it can amass on the sand and on the shore. And if it's not properly utilized, it can begin to decay. You know, it, it can smell quite toxic. But as Dr. Cox has pointed out, we have a lot of opportunities in how we can use this, this biomass as she referred to it. So I have another question for you, Dr. Cox, and this is one that's really could be simple. And it is, what do you think of when you hear the term blue economy? Because a lot of people hear the term seems to mean different things for different people, but you with all your hats, you know, how would you sum up, if you can, the term blue economy? It's always an interesting discussion I like to participate in because I always say, you know, this is what we've been doing for a while as it relates to, you know, sustainably using resources uh, for economic advancement. And, you know, fisheries has been one of the more mature sectors in the blue economy. And since the introduction of the ecosystem approach to fisheries and ecosystem-based management, um, we were working towards that goal of sustainable development, really. Um, but, you know, blue economy and the concept really raised awareness to the ocean's economy and also brought to fore the relationships of the maritime industry, coastal tourism, even waste management. Um, uh, because we know intersectoral collaboration is ideal um, for the ocean space. Um, we can't solve the types of complex issues we have, um, marine pollution, habitat degradation, unless a whole set of stakeholders are on board. And then even uh, more interestingly, you know, seafood supply chains that are fragmented, um, that's restauranteurs, hoteliers, uh, fisheries, health, the health sector as well. Uh, energy sector so you know I had always thought about fisheries being positioned and I called it you know across all the kaleidoscope of colored economies uh, to show how it was interwoven and culture and all of that and being a specialist in the sector you know you know I always thought it was part of a bigger system um, but blue economy started the conversation about that and then um, even as it relates to, you know, exploring deep sea resources, um, bioprospecting, marine drugs, for example. And, you know, you know, some of the sponges found on the Caribbean have been used in the development of, of um, drugs and pharmaceutical products. Uh, and then, of course, one of my other passions is blue tech. And. You know, the fact that we have many challenges in the Caribbean and small island development states, our fisheries and other sectors are data poor, and we don't have the capacity for data acquisition, analytics, and even archiving. So how are we using the technology to help us do that? And, you know, a big part of what I'm doing now um, is using uh, cost-effective vessel monitoring system and piloting that on 30 small-scale vessels in Barbados and then using the data analytics to help us inform our decision-making, uh, valuable input into marine spatial planning as well, but more or less really empowering fisher folk to improve their digital literacy. Um, so that project is called DigiFish. Um, and that's another hat I'm wearing as that's Another hat. You're going to have to spread a few more heads to, to wear all these hats that, you, that you're wearing. But well, that's fantastic. The idea of Digifish and the idea of we, we in the region and, and many other you know, island territories, as you mentioned, the crucial lack of data, it then makes it very difficult, if not impossible, to create effective policies. And without data, it's very difficult to form a presence on a larger stage or on a bigger arena when you don't have the, the the, you know, the numbers and the, and the statistics to back it up. So thanks for drawing that to our attention, Dr. Cox. So we have a question from the audience and someone is asking, and this brings us back to our discussion of sargassum. Um, do we know of any case study where sargassum is used for fertilizer? That's a question from someone. Actually right in Barbados, um, Joshua Fort from Red Diamond, he was producing a plant biotonic um, but we, you know, there has been a lot of caution on the heavy metal content in sargasm and the kinds of 
procedures that have to be put in place to remove arsenic and cadmium, for example. Um, but, you know, they got quite good results. Um, even in St. Lucia, um, Algas Organics, they've been producing a, a very successful plant biotonic fertilizer as well. Um, so quite a few case studies, uh, those in Guadalupe, Mexico, Dom, Dominican Republic that are producing fertilizers. Um, but, you know, lots of conversation around even the, the, waste, the waste product and how probably to dispose of that, um, knowing the heavy metal content. Um, so, you know, a lot of the uses from sargasm have been in the agricultural sector, as you would imagine, composting. Um, fertilizers, um, but more recently, some exploration with SMO solar process to the development of biochar, which is actually good for carbon sequestration as well. Um, so we're seeing some innovation there, even the use of SMO's um, autonomous processor that is, you know, looking at green energy, for example, as well. Um, so um, I think Talasso Ocean, for example, they have a, a drone for harvesting that takes into consideration, you know, bycatch. So they're working hard at innovating with that design. You know, it's electric as well. Um, so they're, you know, developing a prototype and hopefully could start to roll this out in the region. And, you know, I think, you know, what was exciting to me this year was our colleagues in Mexico extracting phacoidin, which is a high value extract from sargasm, and using that on COVID-19 patients as an antiviral agent. And then our colleagues in Cuba uh, working on an antiviral agent uh, for echovirus, which, you know, um, results in meningitis. So in the Caribbean, we're having a lot of innovation going on. Um, some research is, you know, still in its infancy stages, but just imagine if this uh, work starts to become commercialized mm. and have a more, you know, impact on, on the health sector. Because, yeah. you know, the health, you know, you spoke about the exposure and the hydrogen sulfide and ammonia gases that coastal residents are being exposed to. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's fantastic. And I think so much of that really shows us how you know, it shows us the importance of nature-based solutions, but it also yeah. shows us the importance of understanding the science behind those nature-based solutions and kind of balancing, as you, again, these data and the research and the awareness. So, so that's fantastic. You know, Dr. Cox, I would like to talk to you all day because then I can pretend that I'm there <laughs> in the ocean, but I'm going to look to wrap it up in a few minutes. So uh, I want to invite you as well as all the members of the audience to our Ocean Pavilion that we're going to have. We're going to have a few of our team members from Island Innovation, James Ellsmore, Thais Maciel, as well as Audrey. Um, they're going to be there on the ground in Lisbon. And we're going to have a space where people, if you register for the um, Island Innovation Island Pavilion, I'm going to ask one of our tech team members to put the link in the chat or, or on any of our platforms on social media. You can register and then you can be kept updated about everything that's happening in Lisbon, if you want to, you know, we have an exercise with our island ambassadors or island innovation island ambassadors where we ask them, if you could tell something to the leaders who are going to meet at this conference, what would you say? And that's the kind of thing I would like everyone in the region to imagine because we know the role that, you know, the ocean plays. You know, Dr. Cox, you talked so much about its value in terms of, you know, the pharmaceutical industry, in terms of livelihoods, in terms of lives, but also culture and identity, everything you described, fair um, spear fishing, diving, you know, I surf. The connection we have to the ocean is just invaluable. So I really want us all to be aware of it. And this discussion today has really helped me and I'm sure everyone listening be aware of the importance of the blue economy. So thank you so much, Dr. Cox. I, again, oh, I just want to be there <laughs> in the ocean. But thanks thank for taking you. the time. We really appreciate you being here and we'll definitely be in touch. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay, bye everyone. Thank you.